Hi everyone, this video is intended to give you some supplemental background uh, knowledge to help you with your questions on page 280. Uh, the Canada Arm, its proper name is the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System, but with its uh, recognizable Canada logo, uh, it has become better known as the Canada Arm. In 1975, NASA gave Canada the important task of developing a, a device that could assist astronauts with a multitude of tasks. The device that was created has been on more than 50 missions and has never malfunctioned. It has been used uh, in shuttle operations, helped to fix the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, was also used to help build the International Space Station. Uh, the Canada Arm has been used as a workhorse for spacewalks, as an eye in the sky for visual inspection of the shuttles, a portable light source, for public relations activities, an IMAX uh, movie camera was uh, mounted on it, and as a platform to do experiments on micrometeorites. So, got to remember this: there's a difference in between the two things we're going to talk about here. The Canada Arm was on the space shuttle. The Canada Arm Two was developed with the purpose of working on the International Space Station. It was installed in 2001 on the ISS with the help of Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield as a key component to the building of the station. Canada Arm 2 can make its way around the ISS like an inchworm and it is equipped with four cameras to help it see. The Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, positioned above our atmosphere is the Hubble Space Telescope. It is above our atmosphere so that light from distant stars and galaxies that is often distorted by the atmosphere when viewed from Earth is no longer a factor in observing celestial objects. The astronomical tool was launched in 1990 from the Space Shuttle Discovery and it has seen hundreds of thousands of images for, for scientists to study. Uh, just speed stuff up. I'm going to just call the Hubble Space Telescope HST uh, so we can get through this a little bit quicker. The HST orbits uh, once around Earth every 97 minutes. So that's about the same amount of time it takes you to go from the colony to our ice fishing spot. As it travels, the HST gathers light. In fact, more light than is possible for the human eye to detect. Just as with our eyes, the more light the HST can capture, the better the image it can produce. Think about how your vision works in the middle of the night when you are trying to focus on something in the dark. The HST had a problem that was discovered after it was launched. The images it was sending back were blurry. The primary mirror had a little glitch with it. Um, the mirror was just slightly the wrong shape. The flaw was only about 1 50th the thickness of a sheet of paper, but it caused the mirror to focus the light in a different place, creating the distortion in all the pictures. The solution was to fit the HST with glasses. Um, a series of sm uh, these glasses actually weren't glasses, but rather a series of small mirrors called the Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement, or COSTAR and they were installed on the telescope. Sorry, One moment. Siri's picking stuff up again. Uh, another uh, item to discuss is the James Webb Space Telescope. So after the Hubble Space Telescope uh, was so successful, the European Space Agency, so that's a group um, essentially a group of countries from Europe who have gone together to pool their money to create a space program. Uh, so, and the Canadian Space Agency actually joined in with them uh, to collaborate and start building another telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope, or the JWST, uh, was scheduled to launch around 200, or, pardon me, 2013. I can't remember exactly when it got up. I think it might have been delayed a little bit, but it was right around that general area. And astro astronomers from all over the world uh, were 
planning on using this telescope for four main areas of study. Uh, first, light and reionization, uh, how galaxies are assembled, uh, to discover how stars are created, and to take a look at uh, protoplanetary systems that are in other uh, solar systems. Uh, also, the James Webb and the Hubble telescopes will both be positioned outside of Earth's atmosphere and will be used to look at distant celestial events. But there are differences between them. Okay, so these are really big differences. The Hubble Space Telescope would be closer to what we consider to be a telescope. Uh, it uses mostly optical and ultraviolet wavelengths to examine the universe. Its mirror size is 2.4 meters in diameter. Uh, it has a close orbit around Earth. It's only around 570 kilometers above Earth's surface. It is 1.2 meters long with a maximum diameter of 4.2 meters. And it was launched by the space shuttle. Now the James Webb Space Telescope uses mostly infrared wavelengths to examine the universe. So it's taking a look at uh, light wavelengths that we can't even see as humans. Uh, it has a, a much larger mirror, which is 6.5 meters in diameter. Uh, and it is much, much farther out. It is 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Um, Earth is also about 1.5 million kilometers from the sun. So the Earth will be between uh, the JWST and the sun. Uh, the sun shield on the JWST measures 22 meters by 12 meters. And it was launched by an Ariane 5 rocket. Okay, the next item we're going to talk about is RadarSat. On November 4th, 1995, Canada launched RadarSat, a remote sensing satellite. This satellite is equipped with Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR. This radar uses microwaves, which can transmit information or images through clouds, smoke, darkness, and any type of weather condition. A unique feature of RadarSat is that users can select different types of beams. The, the swath of the beam can be 35 to 500 kilometers with a resolution of 10 to 100 meters. It has an orbit of 24 days and gives views of the Arctic daily and views of any part of Canada within three days. If the 500 kilometer swath beam is used, it can give a view of the equi uh, equatorial latitudes every six days. During an orbit, RadarSat can collect images spanning up to 1.1 million kilometers squared of Earth's surface. Information from RadarSat is downloaded to receiving stations in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, Gano, Quebec, or Fairbanks, Alaska. The downloaded information can be given to users within a few hours of when it was captured by the satellites. RadarSat has a sun-synchronous orbit, which has a few advantages. Uh, it has the same view at the same time on different days. It, always, uh, it is always exposed to sunlight, so it can operate on solar rather than battery power. It can, download, uh, pardon me, it can downlink information at different times than other remote sensing satellites can. Other satellites tend to transmit information only during mid-morning. RadarSat allows individuals to receive information throughout the day, not just at certain times. Uh, because Canada is the second largest country in the world, it has uh, diverse landscapes and climates. RadarSat was originally developed to monitor environmental change and help with making decisions about resource sustainability. It has been used for so much more. Uh, for It's been used for monitoring the spring ice breakup in the Mackenzie Delta, uh, for monitoring the flooding of the Red River in Manitoba, and then most likely that's going to be used again for that this year. 
uh, for monitoring crop information in Canada, Argentina, and China. Uh, in China, it was used for monitoring their rice production. Uh, it has been used for monitoring glaciers in Antarctica, for monitoring the Sea Empress oil spill off the coast of Wales in 1996, uh, for detecting forest cover changes in South America. So, for example, it'd be used right now for uh, determining the loss of forest in the Amazon. Um, and it's also been used for monitoring the Guagua uh, Pichi Incha volcano in Ecuador. Okay, just a few more uh, facts to consider as we're going through the space unit. The International Space Station is the most heavily shielded space vehicle ever made. Despite this protection uh, in the International, uh, International Space Station's first 10 years, it had to be moved a total of eight times because of the threat of collision with space debris. Currently, the United States is tracking 18,000 major pieces of space debris but most estimates uh, state that there are over 1.8 million kilograms of human-made material uh, orbiting the Earth. Uh, one of the problems of all this garbage is that some of the debris travels at incredible speeds. If the space debris is orbiting Earth and added at an altitude of 2,000 kilometers, it could have an impact speed of 36,000 kilometers per hour. At this speed, a one millimeter long metal chip, so one tenth of a centimeter, uh, can, can do the same damage as a 22 caliber rifle bullet. And a piece of metal the size of a tennis ball will do the same amount of damage as 25 sticks of dynamite. Some space debris falls to earth, appearing to be a meteor as it burns uh, up in the atmosphere. Other pieces have the potential to do incredible damage to satellites, space telescopes, the ISS, and even astronauts on spacewalks. On uh, February 10th, 2009, um, a deactivated Russian uh, communication satellite, Cosmos 2251, collided with an American communica communication satellite, Iridium 33. This collision was... Uh, uh, occurred above northern Siberia and Russia, and not only destroyed both satellites, but now can pose an even greater threat because of the debris uh, that was created. Now, this is going to be an issue we're going to be dealing with for decades up in space. A lot of space agencies have started to develop uh, different types of satellites to actually help go clear debris. Uh, the European Space Agency has a special satellite that uh, more or less is kind of like a big fishing net in space. It will um, capture uh, different uh, deactivated satellites or space junk and cause them to alter their uh, orbit and end up going uh, or changing the orbit so that it's moving closer and closer to Earth and eventually ending up in the atmosphere and burning up. Uh, so NASA is doing a lot of work with this and the ESA. So hopefully we can come up with a couple of real good plans to help clean up our uh, near space orbits.